This is the closing night for the 2018 Honolulu Surf Film Festival, honoring George Downing. by director Ina Blockino, who's here with us tonight, she's over there. And, and uh, along with subjects Keala Kennelly and, and Andrea Moeller. So the first award we'll be presenting is the Director's Choice Award. This film presents a milestone in the representation of women in the surf genre. And it is a film about women and their relationship to the ocean brought to us by a female filmmaker. I am so happy to announce that the Director's Choice Award goes to She is the Ocean by Director Ina Blockino. Thank you so much. Wow. It's so nice to be here. Uh, it's uh, always a big deal to, to come to Hawaii for me because I'm from Russia. And I don't have the ocean, a warm, friendly, warm, friendly ocean in my country. And uh, I had so much love the ocean. I spent today all day in the ocean. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I hope that this film will inspire people uh, to lo to love it and to care uh, as I am. And uh, I hope this film will it will inspire uh, women to to pursue their dreams. And I would like to thank all the heroes uh, who was in my film. They were so much inspiring me. I, 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 I was teach a lot. So thank you, Jenny, for your fantastic story. Beautiful and amazing, and uh, I love you so much. Uh, and thank you for your aloha, because <laughs> I understand that it's, it's all about love, and uh, it's, it's so big pleasure to be here. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, okay, and now to present the Audience Choice Award for Best Feature, please join me in giving a warm welcome to longtime friend and collaborator of the festival from the Bud Brown Archives, Anna Trent Moore. The great American author John Steinbeck wrote, We have only one story, all novels, all poetry are built on the never-ending contest within ourselves. And he was right. Because the human story is our story, our humanity. They are the stories that move us, touch us deeply, and inspire. The film that did all of this and voted as the audience favorite and receiving this year's Bud Brown Film Archive Award was Momentum Generation. Thank you guys so much. This was the best audience that we played the film to. It was so great to bring it back to Hawaii. I'd like to dedicate this to Todd Chester Genie's here tonight and uh, Todd who's an anchor in our film and such an impact and influential person in Hawaii. We'd like to dedicate it to him, his memory and his inspiration. Thank you. And now
now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the man of the evening, Mr. George Downing. To our kapuna, George Downing, it gives us great pleasure to present this humble little glass memento to the Downing Ohana. my father. There's one special person that I need to make sure you all know, and that's my sister, Kailu. Can you stand, Kailu? <laughs> my sister is very dear to us, and she helped take care of my dad in the last few years, so we need to make sure you know her, and uh, thank you very much. everyone and welcome. I too would like to acknowledge the sponsors of this year's festival who has helped make possible another year of surf films and celebrations. I would also like to thank Taylor Chang, the director of films, and Sarah Fang who harnessed another fantastic collection of films for us to enjoy and honor our history. Ladies, once again, you rocked it. And to all of you here tonight, a big mahalo nui for gathering to celebrate not only the history of our sport, but also to honor our surfing kapuna this evening, beloved Mr. George Downing. With open hearts, it is our great honor to welcome the Downing Ohana. your presence this evening, George's sons, Keone Downing, Kainola Downing, and his daughter, Kaiulu Downing. And we thank their wives and George's grandchildren and great-grandchildren for being with us. drive up the busy King Street until you cross beneath the freeway overpass of H1 Freeway. You will enter Wailai Avenue. Look immediately to your right and you will see it. A lone building. You cannot help but notice it because this one is different from the other string of shops that connect together to form the old shopping district of Kaimuki. It is strong, solid. It is Downing Hawaii, the oldest surf shop in all of Hawaii Nei, and its founder was Mr. George Downing. If you didn't know George personally, you certainly knew of him. Forgive me for being so bold but I know this to be true from my father, Buzzy Trent, and Bud Brown. George Downing created big wave surfing, and through it all, he was joined with a small brotherhood of men who in their quiet reserve simply did what they did because of private will and desire. Creating what most people believe to be the first big wave gun, and a removable fin, George Downing revolutionized big wave surfing, an innovator who cherished the heritage of the sport he loved and respected by the big wave riders that would follow him. He was a quiet maverick who, like all great minds, stood apart from the crowd. 
He possessed an assuredness which was planted in deep wisdom and wrapped in subtlety and virtue. After my father, Buzzy Trent, passed away, I went to see his old friend, George. There was a strong bond between them, a history that went long. Filled with unfinished grief, it seemed like a natural place for me to gravitate to because George was a healer. After I greeted him, rather than responding immediately, he studied my face for a moment. And then he said, do you know what the difference between an acquaintance and a friend is? When I didn't answer, he continued, when you say, let's go, an acquaintance would say, where? But a friend, a friend would say, when? And he paused, and George Downing was the master of the pause. <laughs> and in his George way, quietly said, Buzzy would have said, when? I don't doubt that he shared this story and wisdom to others before me because I am no one special. But he was caring enough to know that this is what I needed to hear. And that is what was magnificent about George Downing. He stood for truth, strength, and loyalty, always. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said setting the example in the belief that if you come from a place of conviction, which is born of truth, you should never be afraid to stand tall, even if it meant standing alone. A selfless steward who perpetuated the ongoing call to preserve and protect the Aina and precious ocean shoreline of the place that he cherished with all of his heart, Hawaii May. And perhaps nowhere was his undaunting standards more prevalent than when he ran the eddy. He was a firm, uncompromising, fearless decision maker. For when he made that call, the one the entire surfing world waited for in great anticipation, it was because it was to be then and only then, he was certain that it would prove to be a moment of truth. And there were many truths to learn from George Downing, and each one was a gift, a jewel, a precious exchange that, like all precious things got, you found yourself polishing over and over again in your mind. One that I find myself doing so is a time when I was planning a trip to Tahiti. I asked him if he had ever been. He told me that he had many chances to go, but no, he said. And then after a brief moment of contemplation, he continued. He said, no need go Tahiti. Tahiti is in Hawaii. And of course, as always, he was right. For I understood the decipheredness of what he meant, that the connection between both places had no beginning nor end. And now, while it appears that George Downing is no longer walking the planet, in a way, he always will be because George was simply magic, and the world needs magic. And most certainly, he has left enough of it to last us all a long, long time. So, here's to you, George Downing. You were a surfer, shaper, environmentalist, philosopher, healer, teacher, friend, father, grandfather, 
husband. And woven through it all, you were this, always this, a man of water. And so tonight, we dedicate this evening's film, The Essence, to you because you lived it. You lived the essence of surfing. Mahalo, mahalo nui. I uh, 
had the privilege of meeting George when I first served from the Makaha meet back in the early 60s and I was a young kid kind of growing up and George was like the, the master and he always he had won it a few times and I sort of, you know, always en was enamored but how good he was and how smooth he was and I thought that's how you really should become a surfer is make a hard thing look easy and George was the one that really did that. And then for me personally, it was great because I got involved in the surf industry really at a young age. And at 15, George sort of took me under his wing and I became sort of an apprentice to him and a mentor. And a funny little story, we were working up in uh, Kaimaki, which is where the downing shop is now. Back then it was the old Greg Knoll shop. And George taught me how to foil a fin. And for those of you that have worked on boards, you know, a surfboard fin is always kind of weird to work with. And, to foil it is when you put the, the taper on it and use the soft pad and George said, okay, you take the soft pad and you start going like this and the first couple passes it went like this and all of a sudden it caught on the edge of the fin and went and there the soft pad went flying off and I went, oh my God, you know, I've got to deal with George. And he just looked at me and says, no, that's okay. Everybody does that the first time. And so it, it's funny that for me, my first really impression of George as a mentor was how to foil a surfboard fin. And I was 15 years old at the time, and then I went on, and then George actually showed me how to shape a board, and he showed me how to band the rails, and it was the first, it, it, we're talking as boards were going from long boards to short boards, and he was beginning to show me how to actually shape a, a board, and the designs that George used, this is back in the 60s now, and there was a surf contest at Holly Eva, and George had this design, and I was in a heat, I think Jock might have been in it, and uh, Jeff Hackman was in it, and George showed up with his board, and the board was pigmented pink. And it was kind of weird that he had this pink board, but that was sort of George's you know, standard color that he liked. And he loaned me this board, and I went out, and it was the first time that I ever was able to beat Jeff Hackman, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and the, the, the design of that board, the bottom shape in that board I used for the next 10 years of my surfboard design. And to this day, I still use the, the design characteristics that I learned from George and that. But I want to say that George and I, be, he was like my mentor, and I got to know his family. And I want to say to Kai and, and Keone and the rest of the crew here that I'm really glad you guys came because it's really an honor to pay tribute to somebody who... George wasn't one of those chest beating kind of guys. George always said, let your actions do the talking for you. And to this day, I've always used that as my emphasis throughout my whole life. And George was running all the, the contests back in the day. And then obviously I became involved in the contest and went on to run all the Triple Crown events. And it was always like, do the job, let the job speak for you, don't speak for yourself. And I've used that to this day. And one last little thing, I'll, uh, we were in Australia during the World Contest in 1970 and George was the team captain and I was on the team and Keone was on the team and Dennis Pang and quite a few other guys that are here tonight. And, and George was kind of the champion of the underdog and it was really funny because there was this girl who back in those days, it was late it was 1970, so it was kind of a little bit still the hippie days and there was this girl that kind of was a free spirit and she showed up and all the uh, security guys were trying to get rid of this gal and George said, no, no, leave her alone, leave her alone. And it was a funny story because we were staying in this hotel and in the middle of the night, the security guys broke into George's room thinking they would find this girl with George. <laughs> <laughs> and George, I was in the room next to George and George ran this, the security guy out of the room, punched the guy out and said, hey, you know, no way will you ever find me with another girl. He says, I'm happily married and I got a great family and they are here tonight and thank you for that. <laughs> I moved to Waikiki from um, yeah, Kailua, and and um, I met George. I think it's 1953. I was about eight years old, and um, I lived across the street from Queens. And there's this place that um, you know during the years we all all the kids gravitated to, 
and it's called the Waikiki Beach Center. And uh, George, at that time, George uh, and his family ran it. And it was, you know, you rent the surfboard and rent goggles and stuff like that. And um, so I grew up in that, in that era. And I surfed Queens a lot. And George was always out at Queens. And the first time I first uh, surfed, the first break, you know, that's when the waves were really big. Um, you know, I was kind of cooking around on the inside. And George paddled out paddled by me and he said, hey, kid, come outside with me. Hmm. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 So I was about 13. Uh, so I paddled out with him. So he said, I said, okay, look, go on this side, go on the left side. I said, okay. And he said, look inside, you see that chair? The, it was a bench, on the way he had benches in those days. And he said, okay, line up with the bench, go a little bit on this side. When the waves come, let the first one go. And then catch, catch the next wave and go left. I said, go left? He said, yeah, go left. So go left. He said, why do I want to go left? He said, you go left. When you come back around, you cut all the guys off. I said, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> went left, went left and followed his instructions. And, you know, cut all the guys off. And then <laughs> came across and went, oh, I had the wave all to myself. <laughs> that's, how <I> <laughs> that's, how, that's how I learned to surf queens. <laughs> and and uh, through my life, he was always, you know, in, in, I'd see him every once in a while. And when I was uh, 16, um, I bought a, my first, my first uh, foam board and from the Waikiki Beach Center. And it was, you know, I, I, had, I used to work at a car wash on the weekends. So I, made, I saved up 70 bucks. And I thought, well, it's plenty enough money. So I went to, you know, George said, oh yeah, I've got a new boards down at the Beach Center. Come, come buy one. So said, okay. So I showed up and had my $70 and I said, George, I want that. He said, okay, 140 bucks. Said, 140 bucks, George, oh, 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 when you got $70? He said, ah, kid, okay, take the board, pay me later. So I said, okay. I never paid him for that $70. <laughs> but I see him through the years and we joke about it. <laughs> I said, yeah, no worries, no, no problem. So, you know, he, he helped me a lot of ways during, during my surf, you know, my surf time. Um, when I first came back from the mainland, I was, you know, maybe 19. I went over there and fooled around, you know, and surfed around in California. And um, I, was, I, went, I didn't know, I hadn't, I hadn't been in touch with my, my dad. My mother had passed away, so my dad just kind of whoop. And um, so I knew her and my sister lived. She lived in Hawaii Kai. So I borrowed my friend's motorcycle, so I was, you know, going down the street, met my sister, and said, okay, your dad lives down in uh, Macaulay Street. Okay. So I was going back to Macaulay Street, and I get pulled over by a cop. Because I'm, you know, yeah, you know, blasting it <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, Right in Kalanyoli uh, Highway. And then um, he said, okay, do you get license? No. <laughs> Whose bike is this? Oh, my friend's. <laughs> and then, okay. Let me run this through. Runs it through, comes back, it's stolen bike. <laughs> <laughs> Not my bike. I didn't, I didn't do that. My friend stole a bike. <laughs> so, so um, you know, I said, okay. He said, what's your, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, yeah, okay. He let me go. He let me go. Took the bike and I took it back to my friend's house. He said, hey, stolen bike. What you let me your stolen bike for? So he said, no, no, no. He was a University of Hawaii student. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, anyway, that, that brings me to the part. You know, a couple of little stories about how George helped me through my life. Um, you know, I saw him down at the beach center one day, and you know, I had to go to court, and you know, oh, man, I don't have money. And um, so we're talking, and, and I told him my problem. And he said, yeah, no worry, I, I, I fix you up. I said, okay. So I have a friend that's a lawyer. I said, okay. So, um, I, he got me, I went to the, I went to the, um, the police, you know, the, the court, and then with this lawyer, and, and uh, he got me off for nothing, no, nothing happened. <laughs> so, you know, I remember George setting me up with that. And later on in life, the same guy was a lawyer. 
I went to speeding court in Wahiwa and I saw John. John, John, you got to you, you, you song and dance in front of the lawyer, <laughs> in front of the judge, and he let you go. I don't know if you got a speeding ticket or not. I don't know if you remember. I, I remember I saw you back home. Hey, John. <laughs> so, anyway, when I went to court, I was like, oh man, I'm losing my license. And I went up to, you know, my turn came and I went, and it was the judge, it was the judge who was the lawyer who got me off in the beginning. <laughs> and, and he looked at me and went, dismissed. And that's about it, you know, uh, oh, one more story. <laughs> about 1969, 69 at the Big Sur. Yep. Yeah. So um, Tiger Sparrow and I were driving around, you know, so this is the year when those houses, I think it was Keiki? Yep. Keiki. Keiki, yeah, all of them ended up on the road. And so, you know, the day after went down, oh, nasty. But the waves are huge, and Tiger and I went up and down the coast for about three or four days looking for surf, it's just so big. And um, so I said, okay, let's go to Makaha. Went to Makaha a couple times, so it was about five days where the surf was just too huge. This one. Yeah, it was too huge. Um, on one day coming back, we, we you know, after coming, going to Makao, we stopped by um, Line of Kale, and we looked, like, hey, two guys are out, one guy's out, oh yeah, two guys. So we said, okay, we'll go. So we paddled out, and paddling out, um, you know, it, it was big, but I didn't think it was that big. But paddling out, and all of a sudden it closed out in the channel. And it's me and Tiger, so we turned our boards over and we did that about two waves and we barely made it out. And so we paddled out and then the guy, the first guy I see is George Downey. <laughs> he goes, hey, Keith. <laughs> you know, I say, hey, Keith. And um, so I paddled out. We, oh, man, the waves are big, yeah. I said, where are you lining up? So he told me to line up. And then I said, who's the guy over there? He said, Kimo Hollinger. Kimo Hollinger, way on that side, all by himself. And um, so Tiger and I caught a couple waves. Uh, the biggest waves I think I ever surfed, uh, even bigger than Waimea, that one day was huge. Um, we got some easy 20 foot surfing. Me and Tiger riding 8 6 boards, and he had an 8. 17 and a half, and I had an 18 and a half. And, um, you know, we, do, we were doing this down the wave. And so we caught a couple, and about the third wave, I wiped out and went in. Uh, that's it for me. And so I, I look, oh, there's Tiger way down the beach grabbing his board. And then, um, so we left. And then through the years, I'd always bring this up to George. I said, George, you remember that day? Oh, yeah. And, you know, we always talk about that day. It was just some, so memorable. And, um, you know, through the Eddie, the Eddie too, he, he was, um, did all the Eddies. And he always asked me to be a judge and, you know, from our connection. So he is a great guy, great, great guy. What an honor to be with all of you, especially the Dami Wahana and this panel. I'll share just a few stories. I've, known him for years, but towards the later years, we'd always go cruising and he'd always call me and he'd always want to go all oh, over. Oh, one of the most memorable, just when he was starting out, he said, if you can imagine, 11 years old, Pearl Harbor hits, mom's divorced, his two other siblings, getting ready to go, the brother of the mom tells them, you guys gotta move to Florida, dangerous. Barbed wire on the beaches, everything. Uncle George goes to the beach, talks to Duke, talks to Sammy, you know, Steamboat and all those guys. He goes, hey, Duke, Bolt, you guys heard anything about Florida? He goes, yeah, I'm good. Larry, what do you guys want to know about Florida? He goes, what? Got girls over there? He says, oh, the girls in Florida. Beautiful, Larry. You're going to love the girls over there. Goes, How about the beach? Nice beach? Oh, white sandy beach as far as you can see. He goes, the water warm? He goes, oh, like a bathtub. Yeah. Unbelievable. He goes, Surf? Get surf in Florida? Go, Laddie, Florida, surf. They go, no more surf. <laughs> Swear to God, they're getting ready to go to the airport. He runs away. 
11 years old kid. He stays back. Mom leaves with her brother and sister. Goes there. Stays back. So he's like a one away boy. And all the people took care of him. From the Beach Boys, Uncle Wally Frostlight. You know, he looked all those guys. And that's why he loved the people so much. He loved the Hawaiian people. And he loved everybody, especially the tourists, because how they took care of them. And then when he had his family later on, you know, they'd always say, like, hey, Dad. He goes, hey, you guys want to be rich? Goes, yeah, we want to be millionaires? Yeah. He goes, OK, pack your bags. He goes, what do you mean, pack your bags? He goes, pack your bags. We're going to go mainland. You like being rich. You like money. You got to go mainland. In Hawaii, if you want to be rich, you can't do that. Because the most important thing is the wealth of Hawaii is not in money. He goes, but the people, the spirit. And I think from Papua's dad, if you could be bought with money, it's cheap. He goes, the best things in Hawaii is priceless and it's available to everybody. And he spent a whole lifetime realizing how important the ocean was. And he dedicated everything. And his mentors, he said, the first 30 years of his life, he surfed and loved surfing and enjoyed everything about it. The last 50 years, he spent trying to preserve it because he knew how important it was. And it was actually John Forsyth, I mean, it was Wally Forsyth, you know. When John Kelly and actually was Lord Tally Hope Lears that started Save Our Surf. And he was one, and he was kind of like their main guy. You know, and they spent their whole lifetime making sure that we had surf sites for everybody. I mean, if you go to Alawai Beach Park, you know, if you go to Harbor and you know that 302 parking stalls, that was from them to making sure surfers could go surf. The beach access, that wasn't normal. They stopped different beach breaks from going over there. And he would take me. You know, through the years that we go down Waikiki and we'd walk from all the way from Kaimana Beach all the way down and be checking every bathroom, every water faucet, every little thing to make sure. He'd write it down, he'd check the beaches, he'd talk to the, go in the bathrooms, check the toilets. You know, he says, Tip top, we gotta have the cleanest bathrooms. He said, we gotta make sure we're protecting our surf sites. He goes, surf sites are our ocean parks because he understood the joy of what it did for him. He says, look at all these tours. They spend thousands of dollars to come and enjoy this place. I said, if the local people can come to the beach and just get in the water, whether it's riding a canoe or taking a swim or catching a wave, he said, it'll change their life. And he really believed that wholeheartedly. And so his whole life was spent trying to preserve surf sites. And one of the main things he always said, and the last thing he'd always say is, no tea groins in Waikiki. You know, for some reason, he says, that's the worst thing you can do. He said, you gotta protect the surf sites. And he said, tea groins will mess up the surf. He says, just remember this. He goes, no matter what, no tea groins in Waikiki. You know, and I took it to heart. That was kind of always his message about trying to teach us and share all his manao. You know, and I look back and I think about the lessons of Kahiyao, about selfless generosity and all the good he tried to do with people. But so humble. I mean, I couldn't believe, you know, he would never want this event tonight. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many different times they wanted to honor him. But to hear the words from Anna Tremor, he just loved Anna. One of the few places he did come was this. If Anna had a film festival, and Uncle George, you know, towards the later years was slowing down, but one of the one things he always wanted to do is says, tip top, we gotta go see this thing because it's for Anna. And he loved Anna and he loved his dad so much. You know, Buzzy Trent would work towards the end of the years, he'd walk about 20 miles a day. And one of the one stops he'd always go and stop by was Uncle George's shop. You know, and all the way to the end, when you talk about a friend, I mean, I tell that to Keone every day. You know, we talk about it. It says, when Keone calls, I go, when? You know, you don't ask what, where, who, what. You know, and when he said tonight, same thing, when? You know, but just the love that he had, and really the love that he had for the people of Hawaii and all of you guys here, and he understood the joy of what surfing did for him. And like I said, the first 30 years, he enjoyed it. The next 50, he wanted to preserve it to make sure that everybody could have as much love for the ocean as he did for everybody else. Thank you for uh, including me in this panel. It's a real honor to sit next to everyone here because when everybody shares their story, we all grew up together. And that's what makes life so special in Hawaii. Okay, I grew up in Waikiki Beach uh, at uh, second grade going through Waikiki on the bus, I saw people surfing. I go, I want to be that. I want to be one of those guys, right? Mm -hmm. So I started going to the beach at seven, right? And George was there to help. He looked after me, kind of like he's 10 years, eight years older, but you know, I was young, right? Learning to swim, and but George was there making sure that 
I could go out and came in safely. So as it went on, I started surfing Queens every day, every day. And uh, we had to make money, huh? so uh, I was shiny shoes. Yeah. World War II in the 40s. After World War II, the sailors were coming in. And, and uh, Leroy, Troy, and Bobby, they were there with me. We were shiny shoes, we had a shoe shine box. The banyan tree. And we'd go, hey, buddy, you want to shine? But they're sitting by the banyan tree. Yeah. They were sitting, right? They had shiny shoes, that's their job. But, hey, buddy, you want to take a shine? Oh, I don't know. If I can get so many kids, your mother had a one gift, I take a pay shine. If I guess it wrong, I give you a free shine. They looked at me, go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, your mother didn't have any kids, so Billy goes, put your foot in my box. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, I was starting to make money, right? And then, if they were walking and they weren't sitting, they came in groups, four or five at a time, sailors, right? Mm -hmm. By the hotels, they passed, and I stopped them. Hey, buddy, you want to shine? No, they don't want to shine. Okay. If I can guess, it, listen, I'll tell you what. You want a piece of ass? <laughs> <laughs> I stopped everyone, every time. Ah, I said, you want to take a pay shine now? <laughs> if I can tell you want a piece of ass? He said, yes. Okay, here we go. Reach in your back pocket and squeeze. So between that and, and making paper hats with uh, Richard O and uh, also one of our best one of our best servers at the time was Squirty. Yeah. Squirty. And also of course Rabbit was around and, and George was definitely around. And so we would look at these guys and go, we want to be like these guys, right? So you pay attention, right? So you get a little older and you get a little better and you can almost make a wave behind one of these guys and they go, oh, you can make a wave behind George Down and that's odd. But rabbit, rabbit, then I knew I was I was good. I was in the, in the So then but as you got a little older, now we're almost like the same age, even though it's eight or ten years between George and I. I can remember special occasions, right? One was we were surfing 98K in the summer. 18 feet easy. It was huge, summer swell. George and myself and maybe someone else, I don't know, but I just remember George and I were there together. And it was a very special occasion for 18 foot surf in London summer. camp in the summer. summer yeah. And another uh, good time is uh, we surfed threes a lot. Uh -huh. Rabbit would take me paddling when I was really, really young. They didn't have alimony yet, the channel wasn't cut, so we were paddling. Went by threes and started surfing threes. I couldn't believe threes, right? Yep. In the in the in the late forties, early fifties, nobody was there. Right? Nobody. Yep. You couldn't even get anybody to go out with you because it's a paddle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was out there little little like Robert George and uh, you know George was on the uh, outside. I, I was on the inside, and in those days. You cannot make a wave behind one of these guys, right? <laughs> because they hold you back. Yeah. And you have to wait. You can't you can't be rushing, right? You have to wait until he goes and you go. Yeah. But knowing now we're older and more consistently more not equal but together a lot, right? Yeah. So uh, I couldn't make the wave because he couldn't make the wave. He made sure that I wouldn't make the wave and he wouldn't make the wave. That's good. But anyway. George was a, a mentor. He was a guy I think we all looked up to and idolized. And his his paddling, everything he did was and surfing big. Makaha had a chance to surf there a couple of times. It was a really big surf. And from that experience, I went to Hanalei and had maybe 20 years of early Hanalei. And surfing Hanalei is one of the best rights in the world. In the world, when it's 25 feet and it's coming from the west, you'll never forget that wave. Anyway, it's all because of spending time with George and Macaw, because that set the stage for the future of surfing huge surf. Anyway, thank you, George. We miss you. Without you, our memories go back forever and mahalo.
Hello. I'm probably the world's worst speaker. <laughs> but uh, I did do some uh, thing to brag about was that uh, in 1946, uh, I came out with the idea of a plastic surfboard. And I went around to the chemical companies and uh, I found a substance called fiberglass. And uh, I found uh, uh, another substance called uh, uh, urethane foam, not urethane foam, but plastic foam. And uh, wanting to make a, a plastic surfboard for the folks, uh, I searched around to all the companies, the chemical companies, and I found this substance called uh, plastic foam. And uh, I, I, I argued, I could, I wanted to do a better idea, but the, the foam company I found got tired of talking to me and they said, you take these samples that we have here because it had been just at, right after the war and plastics were the booming new company, new th uh, thing. And so he said, you take these samples and get out of here. So, <laughs> so I did and I took them home and I built uh, four or five s surfboards and uh, that was the beginning of the era of foam and surfboards. And now, the other thing, I had to put down you men, but you guys really were running the women off of the waves. <laughs> And, uh, so, so this, this foam, the beauty of the foam is it was super light. So I thought, oh boy, I can make a girl's board. <laughs> so I Thank made you. a board for the girls. And it caught on. Yeah. And it spread wide. And today, well, the girls did a good job of writing the boards. In fact, it caused a new style of writing. And uh, so uh, here we have home. <laughs> to say, you men were pushing the girls off the boards and everything, and the girls got so good on these foam boards that they were going circles around the men on their old heavy long <laughs> All you girls. <laughs> I didn't do much else. <laughs> anyway. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> along, with, along with Joe's indebtedness and uh, the early pioneering of people like George and Molly Foyce and John Kelly, uh, we had an exchange of ideas and, of course, those early Folks like, like George and, and, and Joe and Wally were influenced by Duke, who was a very good example of um, having fun in the surf, and, but yet being, you know, being not afraid to challenge uh, bigger waves and, and, and progress and, and influence uh, we younger folks. But uh, George especially was, uh, he not only had a good sense of humor, but he would have a, a sense of being able to 
do as the ancient Hawaiians did. He would have uh, hidden meanings in some of his statements, so you'd think he'd be giving you a compliment, but a <laughs> uh, second or two there, he'd be like, a, oh, that looked like a criticism. <laughs> It felt very good to get, you know, even a, 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 a kind word now and then from George. Like, oh, nice takeoff kit. You'd almost, you know, just eat it in a really bad takeoff kit. But he did a lot of integral things that are very important for uh, people trying to teach other people to surf, like uh, taking taking his his kids uh, Keone and, and Kainoa to to uh, maybe Kaiulu too. I don't know but taking them to look at a, at a surf break and look at the reef underneath first so they would have an idea of how the wave um, took shape in her different swells, as well as his work later on you know, with, the, with, the, with the Sabre Surf with John Kelly and the Bones. <coughs> George was a, was a great influence on all of us, and uh, I want to thank you, Ohana, for being here today and, and being a, a, a good example of uh, some of the concepts that he established. Thank you. Right on, John. Does this work, folks? Yep. Yes. Beach straightened me out, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, I caught a wave, and then George pushed me off the wave. <laughs> <coughs> but I went over to Queens, and the guy ran me over. <laughs> so uh, then, then uh, my family. My cousins were friends with uh, Gadea, um, the George George's wife, and, and she, she she was a really bitching girl. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there when when there was there was a war, the war, and and. People couldn't get jobs, uh, and George gave me a, a job to uh, just take care of his shop. He had a little shop, and uh, he, I, 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 he, I, he, he made me do a job, and I, I don't know what happened to that, to that uh, surfboard. <laughs> 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 but, but but he 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 kind of felt sorry for me because you know I was didn't fit in too good with everybody so uh, he he take me with him to, to go around and do do things and uh, you know I. I felt good, you know, because I could be, be with him. And then uh, we, uh, we 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 had a uh, racing. We we raced, and, and after we were power racing, uh, we was drinking beer, <laughs> and then ran out of beer. <laughs> so. George put us in a car and we went down down to the uh, beer bar and, uh, and we drove the, the the car right inside. <laughs> we right into the uh, where the guy was sitting and uh, George said, "Hey, Asu, g give us some beer." <laughs> <laughs> and 
Man, that guy was good fun. <laughs> teaching the world how to make a badass bottom turn. <laughs> Randy for the, the ambassador of surfing and Joey here for, uh, well, you don't want to know about Big Hanalei, but he does. <laughs> and the man of surfboard industry, foam, polyester, Jock Sutherland, School of Diplomacy, <laughs> Kimo Hollinger, silent but deadly. <laughs> Uh, at Rainbow Drive, one day he said, Hey, how does it feel to catch a hundred foot wave? And I go, Oh, bro, it's like being on the moon. <laughs> hey, big things come in small packages. He said, uh, what did he tell me? He said, Follow your heart, it will show you the way. That's what he told me. And I really, every time I thought about George, I'll never forget that to this day. All the stories that you guys have is just tremendous for me. <clears throat> Thank you, Keone, and your whole family for having us. And that was the best surf movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> surfing will keep you young for the rest of your life, so keep doing it. And this is my surfing Ohana right here. <laughs> honor to share with you and a deep mahalo and an honor to have the Dami Ohana with us tonight. We thank you for being here. Two and three. One, two and three. 